Well, welcome to the church at Rock Creek. My name's Jason Curry. This is Greg Kirksey. We really are so thankful that you're here with us today. At any point today, you got a question, comment, you'd like to interact, there's a number right there you can text us. And you know how to do this on social media. We'd love for you to like, comment, share, whatever it is. Maybe send this to somebody that you think may be going through a hard time or maybe needs some extra help. Whatever it is, there is a way for you to be a part today. We are so excited about this finishing up this series, but in next week, you're starting a new series for us, right? right. Yeah. You want and, to talk a little bit about and, that? Sure. In, in, in the whole uh, uh, series of Unstoppable, which has mm -hmm. sort of been our theme all year long, uh, which almost uh, seems a little weird, <laughs> something would be unstoppable because everything has stopped, it seems. But I'm going to talk about unstoppable preparation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I'm get, I don't know about you. But I'm, I'm getting videos sent to my messenger on a pretty frequent basis these days. And, uh, and, and they're saying, what do you think about this? Uh, what are your thoughts about this? And I'm, I'm detecting this growing sense of fear and panic. And what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to respond? Well, that's what this series is going to be all about. Absolutely. I want to I talk about some things that are plain in Scripture about how you prepare for uncertain times. Yeah. And uh, because we're in the midst of uncertain times, if we can agree on anything, I think we can <laughs> agree it. on that. Yeah. But uh, we, where, where, where there's uncertainty is on how you prepare for this. That's right. And so uh, I, I think we're just going to, I'm, I'm going to have fun with this. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, next week, we're going to talk specifically about preparing through prayer. And I don't want to tip my hand too much, but I, I, I really, uh, I'm pretty impressed with my message for next week. <laughs> Well, that's it. Let's just shut this down and we'll go right into the next. Hey, I, I am excited about that too. We've dialogued a little bit. Sometimes we take for granted uh, how much time we've spent studying the Word, how surrounded we are by people who know the yeah. Word of God. And these uncertain times can cause people to ask, what in the world's going on, right. and we can point them in the right direction. And so we're thankful for that. Hey, if you hadn't been around Rock Creek lately, we're continuing to do ministry. Uh, our children's ministry has kind of gone mobile into neighborhoods. Our student ministry is outside. Life groups meeting. Uh, all kinds of things that are happening, and we're, we're gearing up. We're planning. We're doing the best we can. Yeah to have yeah. our children's ministry back on campus on Sunday mornings. We'll tell you more about that, but we're shooting for Labor Day weekend to kick that off. And uh, we can send out emails and follow on social media. Go to church at rockcreek.com and follow along. But I want you to know this. Nothing that happens at Rock Creek can happen without your faithfulness to give. And so wherever you are, um, whatever this season finds you in, if you're a part of Rock Creek, we want to ask you to continue to be faithful. If this is a time in life where you could step forward and do something extraordinary, that would be incredible too. We're continuing to dream up ways to take Jesus as he is to people as they are, and we will not stop. We're not going to quit. No, nope. We're just going to keep going. That's right. We're going to try to figure this out and be faithful. So you can go to church at rockcreek.com and give this morning. We're going to start out today worshiping together. We're so glad you're here.
Well, if you were with us last week, we learned together that there really is an unstoppable grace from the love of God moving towards you, that God really wants a relationship with you, and it's not contingent on your performance. You could never earn it. It's a gift. God sent Christ for you to not only forgive you of your sin, but bring you from death to life. And this is the part, if that wasn't enough, <laughs> there's even more. There, this excitement, God really is a loving Father who just continually pours out. You remember last week we said He is rich in mercy, like He doesn't just have a little bit left over. He's got plenty for you. Well, not only does God want to bring you from death to life through unstoppable grace, but He wants to work in and through your life so that you would almost be this force of unstoppable grace everywhere you go. Now, we're going to look today, and we're going to see how Paul talked to the Colossians. But there was a transition verse, if you remember from last week, Ephesians 2.10, For we are God's masterpiece. So we talked about this unstoppable grace that has made us alive. But as soon as we become Christians, we don't just transport or teleport to, to <laughs> heaven. Like we've got a mission and purpose right here, right now. And, and Paul writes in Ephesians, he says, we're God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Why don't you listen to me? There is a God-given, Christ-centered, grace-filled grace mission and purpose for your life right now. God's got you exactly where he wants you to make a difference and impact for the kingdom of God, even if it seems that so much is happening around you that's out of your control. God still wants to use you to shine a light on the grace of God that can change someone's life. Now, in the beginning of Colossians, Paul is, I would say, a little bit frustrated. He's invested in the Colossians, and he wants them to understand that Christ is enough, that this unstoppable grace is enough. And there's been some folks that came behind and kind of said, ah, that's not really what Paul said, or that's not what he meant, or unstoppable grace is good, but it's not enough. Yeah. And Paul wants to help them, Greg, get back to really knowing Christ and making him known. Yeah. That, that Christ is enough and living for the glory of God is who we've called to be. The first part, remember, the context is the message. In the first couple of chapters of Colossians, Paul is helping us understand that this unstoppable grace is enough, that Jesus is enough. He exalts Christ as the very image of God, Colossians 1.15. The creator, Colossians 1.16. The sustainer of all things, verse 17. The head of the church, the first to be resurrected, the fullness of deity in bodily form, and not only that, the reconciler. He's wanting us to understand that Christ is completely adequate, that we have fullness in Christ. 
It's what we talked about last week, that you and I are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. So, how do we live that out now? This is what I love. We don't have to wonder, and you don't even have to wonder about my opinion. The Word of God is always going to give us direction for us to step into. And Paul writes, he says this, Since then you have been raised with Christ, right? So that's the transitional phrase. Christ is enough. Our hope is in Him. And since we've gone from death to life through this unstoppable grace, then He gives us instructions as followers of Christ. He says this, Set your hearts on things above where Christ is. So he's still focused on helping, making sure that we understand that, that, it, that it all is centered around Jesus. And he says this, seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. The first thing that I want you to write down, if we're going to live this life of unstoppable grace that we've been called to, is in Christ, we have a new focus. We have been brought from death to life, to focus and live our lives on eternal things. We are the masterpiece of God in Christ, and he's called us to be a part of his kingdom. Is there a chance right now that you're distracted, <laughs> that you've lost focus, right? Uh, maybe you're rebelling, right? Uh, Greg, this is really, I think, one of the things that's at the heart of what we're seeing right now. For Christians, we seem to be distracted. Absolutely. I mean, if there's a word to cap under the caption of today's picture, it would be distraction. Absolutely. I mean, they're everywhere. Yeah. And uh, about the time you think, well, I can do this, then something else happens yeah. and we get distracted again. <clears throat> but that's nothing new. It may be new for us, yes. uh, in, at least to this proportion, but it's nothing new. It's been going on uh, from the beginning, and which is why he's telling us here, we, you've got to focus on Christ. He's yes. enough. And, and the the issue is he didn't save us. He didn't come and rescue us and redeem us so that we could simply be a trophy on his trophy mm -hmm. uh, case. Uh, he did that so that we could be difference makers in the world. So he has a purpose. Like you said at the mm -hmm. very beginning, we're his masterpiece uh, to do good works which he prepared in advance for us to do. That's right. And, and so this is our purpose. And if you lose sight of that purpose, mm -hmm. then you have lost touch with what grace is all about yeah. because grace is not just to redeem us but it is to make us useful to uh, spread the good news Absolutely. And, and, but if we get off track which we do often mm -hmm. uh, distracted uh, and, and you know one of the things I don't want to hijack, no, go. hijack no, it's your good. sermon no, it's here good. But, good, good. But, but, uh, one of the things that happens it's why we call this amazing grace mm -hmm. extravagant grace and one of the things that distracts us is we get distracted from the righteousness of Christ mm -hmm. and we start looking at our own righteousness mm -hmm. and when we start doing that then the grace becomes stoppable grace because it's yeah. not grace then God, absolutely we never do anything that crosses a line that he said oh you've used all the grace there's, there's no more there but we mess up that grace when we start focusing on our own righteousness, our own abilities, our own thoughts, our own opinions, our own agendas. We start focusing on that. We've lost touch with the whole purpose of grace to start with. Absolutely. And and I would say this, uh, one of Satan's, th this is at the heart of what Satan wants us to do, is to take our eyes off Christ sure. and our calling. And so he'll use our, our own effort, um, complete sinful things that we're going to read about here in, here in a second. Uh, sometimes it could be good things. Oh, yeah. It doesn't have to be an evil thing. It's just a distraction, you know? It yeah. could be your phone ringing right now. I mean, it could, it, it's not it, It's not like it's going to be cloaked in darkness and, and you know, fangs yeah. sticking out. It's, yeah. it's not like that. Uh, Satan's too too smart, too shrewd, yeah. too deceptive to do that. So it can be something very good. And, and sometimes this, the, different, the choice is whether we're going to focus on something good or something better. Yeah, that's right. Something. And one of the fruit of the Spirit is, is this self-discipline, this idea that I can focus in, right? Mm -hmm. And I've got to set my heart. Like, that's a choice. That's intentional. Mm -hmm. I've got to set my mind. So here's what I want you to know. If you're going to live a life of unstoppable grace, it's going to be intentional. Now, you got to stay with us for the next few weeks because right. you're going to talk about 
prayer, Bible, Bible study, study, while we were supposed to be surrounded by other followers of Christ. Like this is very much so a, a battle. One of my favorite stories in the Old Testament is, is the story of Nehemiah. Nehemiah knew that he was called to serve for the good of others, right? And he starts working on his God-given calling. And the whole time he faces opposition, 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 opposition. And towards the end of rebuilding the, the wall, uh, Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem come and say, would you just come meet with us for a minute, right? And he says something that is huge. He says, listen, I'm carrying on a great work. I'm not going to come off the wall and stop the work to come and meet with you. He refused to be distracted. I want to ask you right now a very, very simple question, but I really think it's life-changing. When you're looking at the world right now, when you're responding and living your life right now, what's the first lens you look through? Is it gospel-centered? Is it kingdom-focused? Or how about this, if you're my age and under, what's the go-to filter for you that you see the problems of the world, the people of the world, your own sin? We have a tendency to look through all kinds of different lenses, uh, from the world's lens, uh, political lens, my own agenda's lens, and then we manipulate, pervert, and alter the Word of God to fit our agenda. That's what Paul is saying here. He's saying, set your heart and your minds on things that are about the kingdom. That's how you're going to live in the midst of these times where people are telling you all kinds of different things. So think about your life right now. What's got to change for you to focus on eternal things in the midst of the temporary? Or are you just consumed? Come on. Your attitude has not been gracious. The things you're posting and writing, the conversations that you're having, maybe the things you're doing, look nothing like who God has called you to be in Christ. Well, why don't you take a step back the other way? Why don't you turn around? Why don't you start fixing your heart and your eyes on Christ? Paul goes even further and he says this. He, he starts to tell us who we are and, and really what has happened. He says this, for you died. Now, if you just joined us, he's been using this kind of terminology that our, our old life, this old sinful life, who we used to be, is gone. We've been resurrected in Christ to this new life. And he says, so who you used to be, it's dead, right? So who are we now? Your life is now hidden with Christ in God. All of that happened through unstoppable grace. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Right in these couple of sentences here, we see some things about who we are through the unstoppable grace of God in Christ. Why don't you write this down? In Christ, we have a new identity, a new purpose, and a new destiny. When I am in Christ, I'm not who I used to be. When I'm in Christ, I'm not called to what I used to be. And in Christ, I know this. If I'm living for Christ, that's all that my life's about. And if I die, it's even better because I have a new destiny in Christ. When you start to believe that, when you really believe that, all of a sudden you begin to say things like this to yourself. Why in the world would I live for anything else but the kingdom of God? Like, why would I allow myself to drift to anything else? Many times we don't understand we don't see, and Satan really wants us to miss out on who we are in Christ. In this next section, Greg, uh, Paul really, really, really dives down into this to help us understand not only who we are now, but we don't have to be who we used to be anymore. And he uses some pretty strong language here to help us understand that if we are going to be kingdom focused, if we're going to live with unstoppable grace, fixed on Christ, he says this in verse 5, we need to put to death. Think about that. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. What does that mean? It means who you used to be outside of Christ. Remember, you got a new identity, new purpose, new destiny through the unstoppable grace of God in Christ. And so he says this, put to death that old Jew. And then he begins to define some of these things. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. 
because of these, the wrath of God is coming. If you've ever been around church, you've heard people talk about these things, and we should. Mm -hmm. These things are outside of the will of God and really don't have anything to do with unstoppable grace, either for you, from God to you or you living it out. He says this in verse 7. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived. And he takes it a step further. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. And Greg, many times we don't preach about those things as much as we do the first list, do we? You couldn't find a more relevant passage of Scripture <laughs> than this to read? My it goodness. It just describes culture right All the now, anger and the rage and all of this. And you know, the sad part, and I, I mean sad, it makes me sad, is I see people that I know, and I'm talking about good people, people mm -hmm. that I love, people that I care about, uh, people that I know love Jesus and have been born again, mm -hmm. but I see uh, this culture, this climate having had more influence on them in recent times than the grace of God yeah. because they are, they're, they're so angry and so hostile and so unlike who I know they really are. Yeah. And, and yet seem to be blind to that yeah. happening to them. It's like something else is consuming mm -hmm. us other than being consumed by the incredible grace of God. And uh, it, it's, it's yeah. horribly sad. And if it breaks our heart, how it must break yeah. uh, the heart of our heavenly father. And I do think this, Greg, uh, for those in any in any of these situations, a lot of times we think, boy, circumstances warrant it. Mm -hmm. And we've got to think about the context in, in which this was written. Uh, things are not good. Right. I mean, you've got political oppression, the uh, religious persecution. You know, um, The church is having to move from place to place. You'll talk about this. Uh, so many of these folks lost their lives for the, glory, for the glory of God. And still Paul writes, like, I'm not even adding anything to this. Right. Like, it's just right here. Get rid of, put to death, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Why? Because God wants us to live a life of unstoppable grace, right? It is the love of God that will break men's, men and women's hearts and bring them back to repentance. And they're going to see that in your life. Verse 9, he says this, don't lie to each other. I love this. Since you have taken off your old self with its practices and you have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of his creator, like daily, mm -hmm. I'm becoming more like Christ and less like I used to be. And then Paul says this, here there's no Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all. And is in all. I love that. What really matters is this. Do you know Christ? And are you living to make Christ known? Sin always wants to put you at the center. Sin always wants to gratify you. And the call of God on your life is always going to lead you to love others. And what you'll find is what you've really been looking for, what Satan has been selling you, what he's been telling you that you'll find and will gratify in the midst of sin never delivers. And instead, we find all that we need in Christ and Christ in you. I want you to write this down. In Christ, we are not who we used to be. I don't need anger anymore to fill me up. I don't need rage anymore to show you how powerful and dangerous I am. I don't need the impurity or the lust to try to make me feel whole. I've been made complete in Christ because of the unstoppable grace of God. And there's a change. There's a change. Now, I would say this. In our culture right now, and, and, and I want to say something really, really loving here that's a little bit challenging. Right now in our culture, um, you'll hear sometimes people like me teach, well, that's just the way you are. That's not what this scripture teaches. Mm -hmm. The same power that raised you from death to life and freed you from the penalty of sin forever, we're reading here, has also given you the power to be free from the bondage of sin. Now, you're never going to be free on earth from the presence and the battle of sin. But you don't have to live any day of your life underneath the, the authority of sin anymore. And, 
that's a new thought for a lot of folks, yeah. isn't well, it? Well, it's it's really disrespectful of God and His grace. Yeah. Because it, when we say, "Well, that's just who I am," or I'm, "I've just have I've always had a short fuse," that's just who I am. Yeah. It, it's almost like, well. God can't do anything about that. The cross is not enough That's for right. that. That's right. Yeah. And your whole message last week was Christ is enough. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's got it covered. He's got every issue that you're dealing with, he's dealt with. He's taking care mm -hmm. of it. And so for us to make any kind of excuses, alibis, defenses for our immoral behavior, our wrong behavior, our anger, greed, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, is basically a, a huge slap in the face of God Absolutely. who has given his own son so that he can change us and redeem yeah. us. I mean, that's his blueprint for your life. Yeah. The blueprint, God's blueprint for your life and your life, Jason, my life, is that we be examples, reflections of the grace that we've received. Yeah. That's his blueprint for us. And, and this is why your job, my job, Mark's job, pastor's jobs become so difficult because the life that so many people in the world see church people live mm -hmm. is not a reflection of God's grace. And so they, they say, well, God, that, that must yeah. just be a bunch of bunk. It, there's yeah. very few things, Greg, uh, that are a bigger hindrance to the gospel than church people who live lives that are not gracious. Yeah. Right? Right. And, uh, and so I want you to know Whatever you're struggling with, we learned last week, we're born in sin, we embrace it, we're surrounded by it. There's so much that's going on from a spiritual standpoint, but listen, you've never encountered anything that you can't be free from through the grace of God in Christ. That declaration could change everything for you today. What we're understanding is this, doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done, who you are, all that matters is Christ and the unstoppable grace of God in your life through Christ. Now, we need a Savior, but God in His generosity has provided a Savior for us mm -hmm. in Christ. So, this first passage here is what Paul's saying, stay away from that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not delivering. It's never going to, and then I'm so glad. Uh, the Word of God, Christianity is not just about what we're not doing. I would say this, it's more about what we are doing. Like we're saying no to these things because we're saying yes to so much better things that um, that matter. But you know, th th to, to be fair, this, even though it can, it, it can be almost immediate, we are living, and you've heard me say this before, we're mm -hmm. living between the time that we became believers and the time that we will be ultimately perfected. perfected. Yes. And so it's there's going to be a struggle. If you're struggling with yeah. some of this stuff, th that's being human. Okay, yes. it is. But you can't use it as an excuse. That's right. Because God has the answer for us. But there, we're going to struggle. I struggle. Yeah. We all struggle. And uh, in fact, I think that's what we're seeing right now. We're in the midst of a struggle. It's sort of like we're being squeezed and we've been pressed. And, and, what's, so, coming and what's coming out. That's, <laughs> that's right. right. It's, it's really revealing. Uh, a frail faith on yeah. our part. We've lived in, in in pretty in my lifetime. We've lived in pretty good times. Sure, you know it's in Western world. Uh, we've lived in a pretty good affluence and 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 well being and and so there's not been a lot of pressure. We we read the stories of persecution and that mm -hmm. sort of. Thing, but that's not been personal. But now there's been some hardship that we're having to deal with, and so it's putting pressure on us, and it's revealing, unfortunately, in a lot of people's lives, this frail or feeble faith yeah. that just can't keep up yeah. with the pressure. And I, I think this, Greg, when that happens, when you see people living with unstoppable grace, it's easier to spot than it's ever been before. Yeah. The, the, the light gets brighter. Yes, yeah. and, and not only that, when you start having those conversations, it's like a breath of fresh air or a cool breeze on a hot day. Yeah. Uh, man, it, it's just so enjoyable. It, Paul says this. He said, we're not going to live like that. He says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves. So this is the covering. This is what everybody mm -hmm. sees, right? Mm -hmm. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Wow. That when the world sees us as followers, and he's going to keep going here in a second. When the world sees us made alive in Christ, that they would see, they would say, look, there goes those Christians filled with compassion, with kindness. Look, look, look at the humility, the, the gentleness, the, the patience. I wish he hadn't put that one in there. <laughs> 
<laughs> right? Patient, you don't ever get to learn patience until you're worn out with That's somebody, right? That's right? right. I love this. He says, clothe yourselves. Now, I want to tell you a story. And uh, uh, Greg knows my wife, Courtney, really well. Uh, Courtney is the kindest, um, most patient, you know, just, just uh, everything that this is. And then football happens. <laughs> And she's got a little bit of a mouth on her. She does. I mean, she lo- you, you, we share this. She loves Razorback football, uh-huh. right? Gets a little notched up, right? And so a few years ago, she talked me into, uh, um, we went to Auburn to a Razorback game. We were living wow. in Alabama, right? Yeah. And so we got up and clothed ourselves. Like, no, everyone there knew yeah. we're Razorback fans, right? And we got pummeled. And she didn't take it well. The team got pummeled. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. that's right. We, we were close, too. <laughs> and so on the way out to our cars, we were passing all the uh, fraternities, sorority houses, all of those kind of you know things, the tailgating areas and all that. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been to an SEC football road environment. Uh, Christ-like is not the word, <laughs> right? Especially when you lost. And so we're getting yelled all these things. And she starts yelling back, and I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> you gotta stop, you gotta stop, you gotta stop. And she's just telling him, oh, that's fine, we'll beat y'all next year, right? You know, this whole thing. And, and I realized, we can't hide, we're covered in Razorback gear, right? right? And that's this passage, not from a contentious standpoint. What Paul would say is this, in the midst of a world that's not compassionate, that's not kind, It's not humble, it's not gentle, and it's definitely not patient. When you walk in the room, you ought to be able to spot a mile away. Just as clear as anyone could see that we were Razorback fans, everyone in your life, if you have faith in God through Christ, should know that there is an unstoppable grace that has not only saved you, but it has changed you. And when they're interacting with you, they're interacting with an ambassador and a representative of Christ. And can I just tell you, when things got what seemed to be out of control around Jesus, when he's betrayed, when his friends won't stay up with him, when it's overwhelming, when he's wondering, do, do we really have to go through this? Is this the only way? in the midst of the political just oppression, the torture, he just kept loving people. He just kept with patience, (laughs) with compassion, with kindness, with humility. He had all the strength and all the power in the world to do whatever he wanted to do. And he set a standard for us to follow. Paul goes on and he says this, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, and this is hard, forgive as the Lord forgave you. So it's not built on whether they deserve it or not. It's built on how much of a recipient of the grace of God have you been? How could I ever not forgive because I have been forgiven so much? And then here we go. You ready? And over all these virtues, put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. I want you to write this down, and then we're going to talk about it to close. Faith in Christ changes how we live on earth. We are so looking forward to eternity one day. One day Jesus makes all things new. One day there won't be a struggle. But right now, we have a purpose. We have a mission. We've been called to live as Christians. What does that mean? To live like Christ. And so it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. It shouldn't be astonishing. Everyone who sees us, everyone who interacts with us should know that we have received this unstoppable grace and because of that, we are now living a life filled with unstoppable grace. Greg, I, I write things and then I read it and go, that's not what a Christian would write and delete it. Mm-hmm. That happens quite frequently to me. Uh, I want to say things or do things. I get angry. Mm -hmm. I get sad. I I get tired. But then I um, I remember this that this faith in Christ that I'm not my own anymore, that there's a responsibility. That's hard. Yeah. It's not natural, is it? No, and and that's it. What you just said, it's not natural, it's supernatural. Mm -hmm. For you to be able to love 
the unlovable, to to love people in that that, that you disagree with, that you're yeah. angry with, that may even be your enemy. But that's exactly what Jesus told us to do. Mm -hmm. He told us to love our enemy and to pray for those who persecute us. Mm -hmm. That's that's amazing. And I will tell you that last phrase, pray for those who persecute you, that's been one of the things that I have chosen as a go-to uh, when I, when there is a particular individual, it can be somebody I know, it can be somebody I've just seen on television from a distance, but when I get really angry, I, it is a new prompter for me to pray for that person. Mm. And uh, it changes me. Mm. And I know it can change that person, but it changes me. And I, But loving in that kind of climate is not natural. No. It's supernatural. Yeah. You know? It really takes someone who has received unstoppable grace. Yeah to even begin to take that step because no one around us deserves that all the time. No, it's not about deserving. That's, that's what right. grace is. It's that's not about right. deserving. So uh, it, it, it just takes that step. It sure does. Well, I want to tell you this. Grace-filled people become gracious people. Mm-hmm. What about you? Forgiven people. They become forgiving people. People who understand how much they've been loved by God. <laughs> begin to live a life that loves other people for the glory of God. I want to finish by telling you this. A few months ago, I had an opportunity to go speak at an event for a company, and uh, it was at a place that preachers normally don't get to go, Greg. I was preaching at this conference or teaching, and I was excited about it because they had invited me in to a casino resort to go help uh, in this company. It wasn't the casino. They were just having a conference there. And so I started teaching these leadership principles, which uh, all truth is God's truth. All leadership principles belong to God. And so I'm talking and teaching and trying to interject in there the th- you know, the things that I believe and all of that kind of stuff. And it really is one of my favorite things to do in the world yeah. is to go into an environment where no one would expect a, a preacher to be and all of a sudden uh, love people well, help them in their lives and then see how those relationships grow. And anyway, I'm starting to leave and uh, because when when you're a preacher and you're teaching at the casino, yeah. you got to get in and got to get out, right? I mean, I'm there to teach and I got to get out, right? And so I'm leaving and these uh, two ladies are uh, running after me and they're older ladies and, and they're yelling, hey, hey, hey. And I finally realized they were talking to me and I turned around. And I looked at this lady and she looked at me and she said, you're a believer, aren't you? And I said, what? And she said, I could just hear. And then she looked at me and she said, where do you go to church? And I was so excited. You remember the story last week? She didn't ask me where I pastored. Right. She just asked me where I go. Yeah. And I looked her right in the eyes and I said this. I'm a member at a church in Little Rock called the Church at Rock Creek, and they are the most gracious, most loving, most kind, most compassionate people I've ever met, and it really has changed my life, and I meant every single word of it. Can I tell you something, Rock Creek? I think this is us. I definitely think it's who we could be or continue to be, and in the rest of the world continues to be divided, focused on temporary things, that we would engage the world through unstoppable grace. The people from all walks of life, all backgrounds, all races, all struggles, wherever they are, could always come to Rock Creek and know that they would encounter people that above all things have their hearts and their minds set on the kingdom of heaven. If we're going to do that, if you and I are going to live that, it's going to have to start with you right where you are. Could I ask you to do something for me? If you right now today, if you're ready, if maybe you've drifted and it's time for you to just kind of take that step, would you just text to me, I'm in? Just text it right here at this number, just that phrase, I'm in so that we'll know that we can count on you. Because in the days ahead, I don't think it's going to get easier, but in the days ahead, as this battle continues in the midst of culture, eternity at stake, we're going to need unstoppable grace. And we're going to need people like you who will lock arms with us 
and help us take the message of the gospel to this world. Can I pray for you today as we close? Father, thank you so much for Rock Creek. Thank you for the folks that are watching this. I pray for the person who's never begun a relationship with you, that they would take that step today, that they would trust you as their Savior. Maybe they would respond and, and, and ask how to do that. And I pray for the Christians watching this. I pray that we would live lives that reflect your grace. That they would say that there was once a church, a family of people who believed that the grace of God in Christ was enough. And in turn, they lived their lives that way. And Arkansas was never the, never the same. Jesus, thank you for inviting us to be a part of this. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us. We love you guys. We'll see you soon.